Hello everyone, today we make brief history of the Swiss army. I already made videos on Swiss warfare um, in general and never made uh, in-depth um, videos on say Swiss tactics per se or the Swiss army organization and such things. So today we also keep approaching the topic given that we will discuss it better again in detail for the uh, for the Middle Ages uh, and the Modern Age. Today we mm, discuss the, mm, the the military history, also the warfare in general of, of the old Swiss Confederacy, pointing out some broader political and cultural dynamics together with them. Right? I think that um, the the Swiss army topic is very much exploited in form of clickbaiting like ah you gotta look where does the, the Swiss troops the best mercenaries in in medieval history question mark uh, and or um, you know let's look at you know again five minutes of reviews on how the, the Swiss army really was and pretend that you know this is the, the needed explanation uh, to objectively describe the success of a people which, which is something that goes beyond the military instrument per se, and that mm, is always missed in the close of its in paradigm as an explanation uh, when talking history. Sometimes people can be very successful individually by also mm, essentially mm, doing enough for them to secure that uh, the primacy uh, and not even needing to, to take further steps, right? You know, in, in Swiss military history we will see how the country even had the chance at some point of creating uh, essentially a landmass dominion outside of itself. That would have probably ruined uh, Swiss culture for how we have come to appreciate it today and, and yet that is apparently a, um, a counter sense because, you know, we remember Marignano mostly as um, a, a defeat, right? And actually the, the beginning of a at least the decline of a parabola that had been in fact um, a path opening one actually in, in, in uh, medieval and bringing essentially into modern warfare not quite so because actually what the the pike squares eventually became it, that was were still within uh, a combined armed tactics that was eventually established together with modern warfare by by the Spanish um, but still, um, the Swiss represent this uh, very interesting e exception, right? I in a unique military model that, again, managed to uh, consolidate uh, an inviolable position. Like the Swiss, as you know, just like the Dutch, like the, the British later, like are some of those peoples in the world that really are truly rich, right? Not rich in the sense that, you know, you're you're a big industrialized country, and yes, you're an economical or military power, but you're truly very rich. There are a very few countries in Europe like this, um, and the most powerful ones basically are not. Perhaps just the UK in that sense fits the, the that, that scale, that degree. Um, but Switzerland definitely uh, embodies this uh, today, and we will see that the this, this Swiss military culture actually emerged from a rather primitive background, right? That much of the uh, paradox that, in my opinion, we still have to to understand in terms of what it means really to to have a virtue and a discipline at the same time, and not not say just wealth or technological development per se, is what makes the superiority of a civilization, right? And of course, this substantiates eventually to the the enrichment, the empowerment, uh, and so on. But that also changes the story. Um, so that we don't consider, I don't know, the, the Swiss, uh, you know, top military power. But the question um, is still, again, the that war is a continuation of politics. With other means, it's merely an instrument of politics. And as such, we must forcefully understand it. Otherwise, we can throw away history books in the trash bin immediately. Because if we are not willing to understand that, you, you cannot understand how you know, how the Libyans in the Bronze Age succeeded in the same thing, how the uh, Romano-Italics succeeded uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, in the Iron Age. Um, and 
as a consequence, we get a very distorted and um, uninteresting and, and in fact useless, if not even properly harmful, view of how this this really, really occurred. That, that's also why we have to make lots of other videos more about uh, the Swiss Army, Swiss warfare, and also going a bit beyond the uh, just the Middle Ages because it's not just that, right? There is a, the modern age, of course, is much less of the Golden Age of Switzerland military-wise, but it's still very interesting because, in fact, it's the history of the people and it's the history of also the 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 modern country and how it came to be the one that we know today um, and that also passed uh, as we will see briefly today for for part of modern even minimally contemporary Swiss history how that was the case so really in general right the history of the Swiss army per se begins with the formation of the Swiss confederation at the end of the 13th century uh, this of course Theologically, uh, is seen by by the, the national spirit as you know the, the the beginning of something that we see it went further, uh, achieving success. But it, it's important to understand the context of this. All this Swiss Confederacy essentially was born like a landfried, right? And so uh, I made a video, probably also about Friede as as a broader concept in in the German world. And, and when you look at Switzerland, of course, it was just a part of the kingdom of Germany actually mm, as you understand not not particularly developed right it wasn't depressed like uh, other uh, regions that provided with interesting infantry capacity in the first half of the 14th century such and even beyond for the rest of the middle ages like Frisia or the Dithmarsch and um, it was actually developing since the time of Frederick II confirming in his native Swabia that, that Switzerland um, technically was I made multiple videos about the history of Alemannia by the way and we will keep talking about that um, for right for on the tolls for the for the Alpine passes that Frederick had to secure in this um, princely rather than uh, royal policy at that point, especially after 1237 and the Edictum in Favorem Principum, um, that opens, in fact, the space of essentially disgregation of the German state, of the high medieval German state, and the rise of pr private princely powers that, especially after the extinction of the Hohenstaufen, bring. In, in the same way, we had a vacuum of power, um, a situation of uh, you know great competition and and consequent conflict and even mi further militarization of a central European area that was already kind of more warlike because of the lack, for example, of an eastern border and you know the the um, the, the proximity even of properly of the step war uh, on a broader on a broader scale. Um, and thus the local communities began essentially to take matters in their own hands. The Landfried was normally issued by uh, the, the same king, by the same emperor uh, in Germany. I also made a video about this. I think I discussed it in that video called Medieval, uh, say, German Violence in, uh, uh, in the Reign of Frederick II, but we addressed it also um, in another video I made specifically about the Swiss, the Landfried, and so on. Um, and that aimed at the pacification of the land, which was essentially an enforcement right through deterrence and or actual um, display of, of, of military power. Um, and that was now essentially being um, uh, carried out by, again, the local communities in, in a mindset that in modern terms is becoming very difficult to understand, but that perhaps especially people from the countries of common law um, have um, clear uh, the idea properly of having a local force that can uh, um, en ensure fundamentally its own security uh, and just you know accepting uh, an overlord right to preserve those rights further rather than essentially um, statalizing in a more centralistic and pervasive way also regarding the armament. This is very important in, in a country like Swi Switzerland. Um, Germany had some particularly developed areas in the in the Rhineland, also in other parts of southern Germany. Uh, the Swiss mountaineers um, had um, remained relatively peripheral to those kind of developments. When you look at uh, 
what in fact they were able to achieve, especially in the 14th century, we realized that their their military capacity was founded essentially on, on a moral force rather than any other development. This is somehow typical, again, the Swiss fit, as you know, in, 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 the, uh, in the first half of the 14th century, in, in that series of, of very particular peoples. We're talking about the, the Flemish, uh, the Scots, partly the English, of course, but mostly through a royal, in that sense there is a bit of an exception of royal intervention in the system, but especially in this peripheral areas, in fact, of, of the Holy Roman Empire, Frisia, the Dithmarsh, and um, parts of the same, also of central Germany, and some burger communities, um, but more softly, and, and in Switzerland, right, um, the uh, little force of the Confederacy stood its first test in the decisive victory over the Austrian Habsburgs at Morgarten, in 1315, it's a very interesting battle because fundamentally it's an ambush, right? So when you study this and you want to test, let's say, the effectiveness of, for example, of infantry capacity to withstand cavalry charges, this is something that you see among the Scots the Flemish. You realize that this, this major victory was essentially an ambush, right? The, the Habsburgs didn't even have the time to, to deploy, right? And so in, in war, that's perfectly fine. It's not like uh, um, unloyal me, right? The, in war, you always... Um, try to seek the uh, to, to to put the enemy in a condition of inferiority through asymmetry warfare is asymmetric by definition there is no such thing like symmetric or asymmetric warfare just um, there is some kind of conventional or more or less conventional type but it's you know, a, a wholly relative concept in any case that was the good enough right the Swiss managed to maintain their own um, independence de facto because that's also where it was heading in the perspective of kind of centrifugal forces um, in the Holy Roman Empire or as, as far especially as central power was concerned the only case of secession telling the truth was would be the, the United Provinces during the 80 years war but indeed the, the Swiss Confederacy would be forming essentially as a state on its own so that, they, that they're not just the mountain Germans but they are properly another nation uh, that is molded in, in these battles. And again, at, at the beginning, like, um, you know, they, they had, in many ways, uh, also a very similar mentality to what kind of an average um, German take on the concept of autonomies or, in fact, political and military activity w w was concerned. But the, the Battle of Morgarten was impressive uh, in Western Europe at the time because this, this was fought essentially by peasants, this was were, at the end of the day, against noblemen. Um, foot soldiers also against an army consisting, uh, or at least having in cavalry its decisive element. Um, and the success of the newly formed League uh, would thus sanction the, the rise of this polity as, um, a, as also an internationally recognized one. Right. This this aspect is particularly important. It it is true that in all the early 14th century infantry, and I mean purely infantry victories, because that's what we're talking about, just uh, foot armies over, of course, well, it was the normality at the time. Actually, the mix of uh, cavalry, decisive element, and the infantry in, in the aux uh, auxiliary function. Um, that um, that they weren't composed ju that they were composed just by peasants per se. Of course, there was always an, a knightly uh, element in them that was much more crucial than we think because not not much from a military point of view, right? But also from a from a political point of view because these men were essentially riding the local autonomies to decentralize powers so to aggrandize their own, and the men at arms were the only people who had that kind of military expertise necessary to confer to these rebels of, of, of peasants um, an adequate collective training in order. It is true that in warfare, really, it's not even important what you have in your hands, but how much you want to kill the person in front of you. Um, and, and that is much more consistent than we imagine. But there, there is always, of course, we're talking about feudal Europe. So, you know, where and or, or another, what the, the territories that today we consider um, Swiss from just one canton that is Schwitz, but that were, as we were saying before, in fact, essentially part of the Duchy of Swabia and just 
part of the, there was a normal as we'll see like a landed nobility right uh, lay and uh, ecclesiastical alike it was a typical place you know in Europe at the time it was compacted uh, in a communal sense um, where of course also the knightly uh, element did exist but was in a sense adapting to the local political and social um, reality that we will see um, better a little bit and um, among the causes of the, the Swiss victory at Morgarten we can find the nature of the terrain right in part again the Swiss had uh, from their side the fact that historically they had come to inhabitate in fact this Alpine uh, pre-Alpine valleys um, think about the Alamanni crushed at the Battle Tolbiac that were essentially settled as refugees slash military colonists by Theodoric the, the Great to, to garrison properly the Alpine passes and remaining entrenched in there and, and always think that there is a, a big deal of um, of uh, that ancient that old Germanic uh, fulcum uh, in, in, in properly in the Swiss mentality at this time still because again some of those valleys had remained um, you know asleep um, during time and it's as if the latter had stopped there right and so even their lifestyle and their uh, their mindset hadn't changed so much right how much could really a mentality change between 500 and 1300 in some relatively isolated uh, places um, uh, yet um, Switzerland as we will see was not isolated just right and that is also uh, the external influence, the, the the awareness that something was changing in Europe as well, did bring confidence as well within these communities uh, that began to to increase their own assertiveness properly on the, on the established order uh, before. Um, as we've seen, Morgarten is an ambush, so some passages, some um, some paths that were just, of course, better known by the locals um, are can be exploited very skillfully. The, the Swiss had the, the mountains, the forests, the Dittmarsha had, in fact, the marshes, um, the swamps um, uh, that can't really put cavalry in trouble, especially when there are narrow passages that prevent uh, the units, cavalry and infantry alike to be readily deployed. Um, uh, in in all their in all their width and uh, they're especially caught by surprise and bitten uh, with time. This this is a constant that we will see also in, in Swiss warfare from the, the the radical turn of the mid 15th century. Where that's where it really began to be s literally something else. But already at this time, the Swiss infantry were quite um, quite aggressive and quite effective in that regard. There are there are uh, battles in which um, the the Swiss managed to, to withstand cavalry, feudal cavalry charges uh, on the top of a hill. Again, always were a very skillful exploitation of terrain, but still there is that robustness of the collective training. Yeah, uh, except uh, again, up to the mid 15th century, all these infantry essentially had a merely um, or mainly defensive purposes, or at least moving in open ground in, in the, the, the expectation of facing cavalry was not practiced at best as we will see at Zempach uh, the, the point was again catching the enemy by surprise where he was already pinned uh, frontally with through a through a flank uh, attack a surprise one that's yet another thing um, and it's wrong um, to imagine that the Swiss of the forest cantons, uh, this, that are the protagonists of these battles, were just peasants untried in war. We mentioned the knightly element, so the professional military uh, intelligentsia that was, in a sense, schooling these commoners. But there is also something that is more typical of the age on some kind, in fact, of also international level. In fact, the Swiss... Um, troops were accustomed to the use of weapons. Many of them had served in the pay of the northern Italian city-states that at this point really pioneered uh, 
um, European tactics, especially infantry-wise, uh, and that doesn't have to be uh, underestimated. Mostly when we study Italian warfare at this point, we talk about German uh, cavalry per se, German mercenary cavalry. Um, but I think there is a lot to say about um, the infantry as well, which is kind of dumb because it doesn't receive, it doesn't provide with, with actual evidence of that. We know that um, the the foot troops were everywhere, but they, they enjoyed much less reputation, right? But just the fact of being having been framed in some, even in some modest numbers, it's not that we have to think of mass phenomena, but in the, in the great, again, um, Italian communal armies of 30,000 men with, you know, infantry wings on the, the, the cavalry, um, battle lines of 5,000 per sign, in fact, and that maintain the alignment with cavalry that advanced the, in this kind of gradual uh, effort and were meant also to engage um, the enemy cavalry on the flanks, uh, having defeated the, the, their own foot respectives in the front first. Under a range of tens of thousands of quarrels in an hour, well, th that's something that really habituates you to, to some standard collectively, um, also professionally, right, whenever we look at different kind of a material contexts, like in history, like in this case the communal one, or I don't know, the, the classical political one, we, we often forget that even in the moment of, say, standard amateurialism of the average trooper, still there were mercenaries, and there were people that, in the sense, were meant properly to teach others how to fight, how to train, uh, and so on at, at many levels. Uh, the um, Swiss troops um, had also taken part in all the imperial campaigns of the 13th century. So there, especially considering they were part of Swabia and so under the, the Hohenstaufen that often campaigned in Italy again um, on, on a regular basis during the Romfahrt and so on, um, that is also like an important mm, curriculum, All right? Um, we know of uh, Swiss ministeriales in important battles fought. Even the same Habsburgs were Swiss, right? The same the same Hohenzollern were Swiss. Um, they came from the same areas, um, and so that kind of military business, that especially in southern Germany, was quite active with the ministeriality, especially the the greater amount of wealth and outreach compared to to northern Germany, um, and this proximity, the case of Switzerland, especially as a crossroad between, again, Germany, uh, the Rhineland, um, the uh, France, Italy, it's crucial, because some of the finest military cultures of the time were essentially just crossing, right? We have the, the Swiss fighting for uh, against the, the, the Savoy, that are, as you know, are some of the historical enemies of the Swiss. Well, the Savoy uh, figure prominently in uh, in French armies at battles like Mont uh, against the, the, the Flemish infantry, that uh, at a point that uh, asks the same Count of Savoy to that they had. Um, you know, known historically because it was connected also with the um, Comital dynasty um, of Flanders of the Dampier that had also fought in Italy and now as knights were actually leading the infantry armies in Flanders against French cavalry um, to, to negotiate with the King of France. So you understand how little the world really was and how much the international connections actually were and this is probably one of the single most brutally underestimated topics by medieval uh, warfare historiography today nobody studies these things but they're basically the sap of this all um, and uh, the the export of some military models such as in the aforementioned fr uh, for example franco-flemish war the use of lombard tuscan um, mercenary pikemen that the same Flemish uh, communes were impressed with because they had never seen properly the type of pike. The fact that somebody like um, Castruccio, for example, was at the same court of Edward II at the time of the wars with Scotland, and that was one of the most successful commanders of the same age um, in his native Tuscany, and had crossed literally the Alps, and where the Swiss are in between. Like, this all means something, right? And it's probably overlooked. Of course, Switzerland, as we'll see now, doesn't quite provide 
yet much kind of output for us to say assess maybe this this voices this thing but this was essentially mostly an oral world um an illiterate world and the uh, the, the, whatever the, the the ideas circulated, like especially sheltered in the, in the various Canton valleys, were some military secrets were, were literally kept. This was part of the um, of the country intelligence and, and, and strategy as well in, in their mil for their military reforms and organization over time. Do prevent us from from knowing um, certain aspects of how that this mechanisms that surely were, were very gradual but deeply felt by these people really really were um, so the rise of infantries all in Europe at this point had that again would be brutally put down by the mid 14th century wouldn't retake uh, steam in fact before the same Swiss as we'll see now in the mid 15th century invented literally another model of fighting that had paradoxically nothing to do with its own their own self um, in the previous years, a bit like the difference. Um, it, it's still a solely infantry system, but it's it's a dramatically more collectively trained, large-scale one that is not to be found, in fact, in the Middle Ages before, um, if not by these um, influences that we have seen, especially from the South, but um, that is um, pioneered by the Swiss, mostly that level of um, training that allows for infantry to pass on the offensive on a regular base um, and especially to maintain um, a cohesion in spite of the speedy maneuvers and that really it's really anything there is no r real other mil say tactical sophistication to Swiss warfare but this we'll see it now but it was again enough and nobody had had the political social preconditions to carry that out that is also the the often missed missing part um, and as we were saying before the, the idea of the ancient zip uh, comitatus fr from a, that kind of dramatic background is we're s still living definitely in this was blood um, first of all small local feuds prevented their arms from rusting Again, we I made several videos about these clashes in Germany, at a, uh, terrifying ones in, in, in extremely small scale sometimes, but it could last for decades, right? And and so these were surely places that were saying before that were quite warlike, mentally speaking, on, on their own. Um, so these people knew how to take arms um, in again mostly amateur ways, but still with this ever greater. Um, awareness of the possibilities, the potential of the collective capacities, um, and in in the subsequent generations, having essentially said nuts to the previous feudal lords, mainly the Habsburgs, that now were also uh, practiced the most important um, family uh, in, in Germany, uh, they th the Swiss would be constantly involved in defensive warfare which their system was modeled and turning out to be quite successful. There is also an environmental side of the story, right? The art conditions of life in the mountains playing an important part. Um, the Swiss were engaged in an unremitting fight with nature and a struggle for the bare necessities of life. Um, they were hungry. This is a very important ingredient for military success. There were prosper towns in, in Switzerland at that point would come to dominate the Confederacy and also mm, you know pioneering the military uh, updates um, in in the region but the, the majority of Swiss were properly mountaineers right and so they were also properly tough individuals they lived um, in some of the as you know highest grounds uh, inhabited grounds in Europe that's surely not an opulent uh, environment, as we will see, Switzerland even lacked metals. Like it apparently wouldn't be like a, again a peripheral mountainous area. So it's not where new powers normally emerge from historically. Here, Swiss makes um, an, an exception because that sense of virtue that is needed, so that that capacity of testing your own limits, right, rather than just theorizing things rationally 
which is always necessary. You need knowledge, you need intelligence for winning wars, right? Not just brutality. Brutality and courage are literally the cheapest quality in every people. Uh, there is no people in history that wasn't capable of, of, of exterminating or getting exterminated in a war. Everybody's capable of doing that. You have what really makes military success is the combination of virtue and discipline at the same time, right? And these are two things that you can't quite invent on the spot or having, in other words, a culture that immediately has them in, in, the, right, um, in the right proportion for a functional, for a functional development. Um, the cantons were already kind of habituated to carry out some collective expeditions, um, as it's clearly shown by the, the forays practiced throughout many generations by the men of Schwitz, for example, against the lands of the Einsiedeln Abbey. So looting the richer lands, of course, that kind of almost properly predatory um, imperial idea, right? I don't have the resources, so I go grab them. And if the other doesn't, if the other gives way, I, I profit, I seize, right? This is a normal kind of neurocognitive um, human, uh, I would say existential uh, identity, right? It's not even a, a behavior. It's literally how our brain is designed genetically to operate. Um, so uh, how were the Swiss organized at this first stage? Well, in principle, like the old, um, uh, the old uh, Zippe, or Comitatus, at least in, in the case of those who also practice warfare in a mo bit more of professional way, that the core of mercenaries running around, as we've seen, kind of also lecturing, training, disciplining others. Um, from youth to old age, uh, in principle, everyone was liable to bear arms, right? And as you know, this is in, uh, in Switzerland still kind of a, a part of, of that culture, right? One of those countries where basically everybody has guns, but also has one of the lowest um, manslaughter rates um, per population. Uh, and witness to properly how the, the, the Swiss national identity has been built, designed around the rational use of violence. So the, the carrying and use of weapons were a matter of course, of course, for for the 14th century, it's clear also from the agreement known as the Pfaffenbrief of 1370. These were some essentially agreements uh, among the, the various cantons, mostly in, in, in function of some campaigns they had to carry out. And at that time, the administration of justice was organized within the four forest cantons, and among other things, um, other military operations were forbidden. So what is interesting here, you start seeing a collective discipline being imposed on these communities by themselves to say either we are all one. So politically cohesive, which is the key of, of, of success, or, or not. Right? And all men who could not perform military service uh, paid a tax instead so there, there were also, of course, some resource put in common uh, financially, and everyone was obliged to keep weapons in readiness on a scale proportionate to his wealth. It's also pretty normal, so, you know, from manager Germanic times and in or any other uh, militia works fundamentally like this. And this also applies to, interestingly enough, widows and single women. That this aspect is important in Germanic culture because uh, mo while most um, communities in the past during the migration year, etc., stressed the, let's say, the superiority of a single race, a single stock, a single lin lineage, like the one, um, in fact, a dynasty, a monarch could become, and so just delete a few other, and unironically, some of the most successful Germanic peoples such as the Longbirds, that in fact in their myth uh, of, 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 when, of uh, adoption by Woden include women in the entire thing, but by literally using their own hair as m mimicking a, a beard. 
have a concept of the of the community which is which is absolute in itself in other words the entire population is um up to the effort is r revolved in, in a true university in, in the etymological meaning of the term towards this political and military activity so that even the women as part of of course somebody's family because they weren't uh, free uh, nor they in that sense they were used for the military expeditions but according to medieval laws they had a, um, a certain amount of wealth that they could autonomously dispose of and, and as such uh, they were taxed they were obliged to, to participate to contribute um, to this military effort right it, it, this is deeply interesting because again it's everyone right and not one less this concept is deeply ingrained in that sense of, of, of with unity this is what a true nation is not nationalism where the weaker people essentially think to be not to be lesser persons just because they belong on paper on an ID card to a certain they have a certain citizenship this is the difference between nation and nationalism superior people and lesser people respectively um, and this is proven by eventually the facts on, on the battlefield um, plus of course anyone who evaded his military duty in the 14th century was heavily fined and publicly dishonored because the concept that was that of course they they wouldn't danger the all the rest of the community right and this is a very ancient concept principle the ancient germanic culture was based on this the ancient roman culture was based on this um, and it was still obvious in a non-modern or secular context like the the one we're discussing here to to reason still like this because probably throughout the centuries nobody had ever thought locally to that there was even another way the world w was made and it was even the right one traditionally this naturally turned also in pretty interesting things such as a sort of war fever the fact that these men were almost ritually engaged in warfare because that's what the comitatus at the end also maintained in their mentality um, and this constantly obliged the same confederates to enact new and stricter measures right it was an ever greater control the experience of the battle of zempach in 1386 and the minor conflicts that also preceded it led to the zempach uh, brief which again laid down that no canton should engage in warfare without due cause it, it also provided penalties for deserting the colors between uh, before battle right um th this aspect is is important because um this the swiss did have problems to keep all the cantons together these laws were of course being enforced exactly because there was somebody that otherwise would would break them right the battle of zampak like like in others as we'll see um some some victories scored by the swiss also occurred essentially at, at the time not all the cantons had reached the battlefield which in a sense would begin the same disgregation of the confederacy that would occur politically and also confessionally during the 16th century because it was seen that okay you're enough to do that i will do something else on my own because naturally each one of these cantons still believed to be free and so that they were just associating confederally but they they had different reasons and different rules to obey there and, and of course not everybody agreed and so there were some blocks factions parties that uh, were stronger than others and could carry carry this out zampach is a very interesting battle tactically we will talk about it at some point because um it, it it's one in which the the swiss face the austrians again um in um in in open field practically um as they withstand the frontal attack of the of the Habsburgs uh, that dismount their first battle made up of knights relying on the fact that the knights lances were longer actually than the Swiss halberds never commit the mistake of thinking that the halberd has anything to do with the capacity of stopping a cavalry charge it had nothing to do with that only pikes stop cavalry charges halberds are best that you can use when 
you know, the cavalry stopped and is vulnerable. And we have evidence of the same 14th century from these chronicles that exalted the Swiss Boj and, and the Halbert later, uh, that, that it could literally cut in two knights. Na naturally, there may be some fictionality in that, but yes, the these weapons were were spreading terror among their enemies because was, they were also designed to be brutal mm, can openers, right, and killers, of course, natural of, of everything that was in them. And at Zempach, actually, the 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 Austrian knights had dismounted because of the difficulty of the terrain and so on. Um, and the, what was still generally thought that, of course, knights, men at arms, were were superior to the, this bunch of communal scumbags. Um, and, and in fact, they were right because the first Swiss battle line was 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 defeated, and the Swiss, however, managed to defeat the Austrians on a collective level, on a superior level. And that's where it's the inferiority of warriorism and the superiority of of, of collective uh, discipline, and also a virtue in the form of risk to take, because the Swiss managed to send one battle on on the flank of the enemy array and make the, 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 the essentially the make it collapse gradually all the, the enemy battles that see the disaster and uh, and retreat Th this aspect is particularly important because it shows again that as it will be evident also in the broader history of m modern warfare that of course the individual force declines in favor of the collective one of course a man at arms is dramatically superior to an individual I don't know uh, a Flemish with a, with a good and dagger, a Swiss with a bulge. Um, but it's the collective effort that is somehow strong. It's, it's another worldview, in which in that sense also the, the elitism of, of the knight doesn't quite find um, a political social functionality and is defeated militarily uh, on, on the battlefield. Um, naturally, yes, this, this country is somehow... Um, still relatively peripheral in, in, in the broader German context. Not, it's not when you win the control over the country that is what the Habsburgs, the, the Luxembourgs, etc. Were, were still trying to, to do in, in a royal policy in Germany. But again, to the single people in Switzerland, that, that was enough right, to preserve their own, their own liberty. Um, there are other interesting and somehow common, medievally speaking, uh, disciplinary uh, norms that are enforced, like religious houses were not to be violated, um, excess against defenseless women were strictly forbidden. Th as you find in all the medieval disciplinary um, provisions, because you understand that this was normal, right? Uh, this was constantly done. Uh, Christian armies habitually dis sacked churches and burned them down and violated like any other army out there because everybody really did it the, the coercive capacity of the, the leaders uh, in a pre-industrial pre pre-contemporary state reality is are, are low um, so um, this this digression this diversion and also loss in actually narratives happen because the individual there reasons, in fact, individualistically, and weakens the group as a whole, and that's why also discipline is useful. You can even uh, wage much greater destruction o on a country with al also all the civilian cost that it entails without really being uh, somebody that, you know, rapes children like a vulgar animal. And it's not a surprise that those people who do are so unsuccessful from a military point of view, just speaking of nowadays. Um, so here it's, it's always the, the thing, uh, the superiority of human civilization versus the inferiority of barbaric scum. Now, the 15th century involved the Swiss Confederation, which um, had meanwhile grown to eight member cantons in numerous wars. Uh, the most important one, the most famous ones, of course, are the ones of, against Burgundy, the one of Charles the Bold. This was, as you know, a suicidal Burgundian policy that it, that didn't even require, you know, the, the 
the scale, the, the massive military intervention of other traditional enemies, such as France, that would, as a consequence, just you know, cash the entire Burgundy um, after the the defeat and the death o o uh, on the battlefield of Saint Charles, but not before the literal destruction in three consecutive battles of the of the same Burgundian army that, by the way, was one of the most advanced at the time, was one of the most professional, best organized, doesn't mean that it was a, um, you know, um, an inferior model in, a, in an absolute sense, or that it was just, you know, the face of tradition or feudalism as you find somehow set in front of this, you know, um, prorompant modernity that the Swiss were emboldening, but there is hardly any of that. Right. This is if you look even at how the battles were fought. Right. The Swiss took an enormous risk because most of the times were just you know they were not they they didn't have an advantage at all and things are not do not go how they must because of some deterministic cause. Right. It's people that make it happen against the odds, which is yet another thing. It's a a, a much more deeply spiritual and moral uh, dimension. Uh, I made some videos in the first days of Sharpen to Belt, the, the Burgundian Army Organization Tactics Battle Arrays, and from those you can absolutely realize how even those, um, let's say, all those informations that we can derive from the fact that, again, the Burgundian Army was one of the best documented at the time, actually reflect the, the, the what was the Burgundian uh, art of war on the battlefield it was, by the way, pretty standard for the time. Actually, it was more, even slightly more advanced. But they, um, uh, you know, they were essentially fighting like many other armies still would. The problem was not the formula, the 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 tactics, the formation, whatever. It was again how much effort you put in that. In this sense, this was win a moral struggle. So I will make surely some videos to to explain this battle also because we've never made actually a um a battle video about any of the major uh you know Murat, uh, Murat, uh Ganson and Nancy. But um that would would help definitely. I hope we'll have the time for that. Um and so what you see here is again an army of foot soldiers consisting of both peasants and townsmen confronted with a well-equipped professional army and winning uh, because of its toughness, skill, good fortune, because there is no military success that can be achieved without fortune. You can be the best army, the best commander, the best training, the best strategy, best logistics, whatever, and screw up everything completely, and not even just because you did anything wrong, right? Uh, just um, because you can be wiped out at, at every moment um, just by an enemy an enemy choice that uh, the, the consequences of which are in war as the realm of danger unpredictable largely um, so what had happened to the Swiss army in the meanwhile right because the the in these battles the Swiss also take on the initiative we are in the in the second half of the 15th century. Well, a very overlooked step in this, at least I don't know whether it's uh, 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 the, the experts acknowledge this, etc. I don't know how this is known in popular culture because I don't watch other channels or whatever. But the the real difference here is not where that these were just the Swiss um, or anything related, for example, to the Swiss victories of the previous century, but something that had happened in the course of the first half and the mid of the 15th. Uh, in 1422, the Swiss had been defeated at the Battle of Arbedo against the Milanese of the Count of Carmagnola. And what had actually happened there was, again, just like as we've seen for the Habsburgic Knights at Zempach, that the uh, Italian men-at-arms had dismounted. Uh, they had longer lengths than the than the Swiss halberd um, that made up the majority of the, uh, the the weapons. It's not that they had an ad 
they had an advantage because of the length of the weapons, but not because of the weapons per se. It was because the men-at-arms were, of course, more trained, also collectively, to maintain an effectiveness for such de facto pikes when you dismount it. Um, and that w they were perfectly trained to do so. We've seen it also at the Battle of Poitiers, the, the, the French, in order to, to charge the, the English foot soldiers on a difficult ground. They had properly all a type of different shoeing, uh, different lances that they were designed for the occasion. So always remember that the men-at-arm fights everywhere, in every kind of condition, with any kind of weapon, in any kind of formation, because it's trained exclusively to do that, right? In other words, to, to slaughter people on a large scale as uh, a profession. And in fact, what happens at Arbedo is that these dismounted men-at-arms manage to repel. Again, it's not a technologistic stereotype, uh, but it's... It, it, the the effectiveness of, of these men in their in their level of training as we will see now because that's what the Swiss call it that brings after the uh, defeat for the cantons to uh, reflect on it uh, this collective as we've seen kind of in fact confederal um, background in sheltered in the in the impenetrable valleys of the confederacy to experiment a new military model it's a literal reform that could be carried out uh, because in fact of the aforementioned S Swiss political cohesion that after all had been achieved because throughout this time the Confederates had been successful had expanded in, in, in the main surrounding mountains at the expense of, of Savoy they had conquered Lausanne they had been done very interesting things uh, we can see in detail at some other point um, and they um, decided to invest their own wealth that as a very large country after all in, in a politically unitary sense at that point could in fact afford economically for increase dramatically the collective training of the troops in other words you can't again have the most warlike people but if they don't know how to maintain the cohesion uh, maneuvering doing it speedily and so on they're completely worthless right that's the reason why i don't know europeans took over the world in the in the 18th in the 19th century of course individually there were some savages that lived as warriors their entire lives with just you know an orderly uh musket volley and the the rigid training of the of the of the european fantasin was enough to wipe the hell out of them. It's not that the Europeans weren't def defeated here and there, but of course the overwhelming civilizational superiority is unappealable. So the Swiss train essentially their troops for the famous Pike Squares that we know eventually until the predominance of, of musketry fire, linear tactics at the beginning of the 18th century, that uh, consistent again in having thousands, literally, of men in single one of these blocks equipped all with pikes now yes there was somebody still with a halberd some internal guards in the center of the square all these kind of things uh, there were also missile troops but overwhelmingly these are ar swiss armies were made up virtually only of pikemen they didn't have cavalry consistently not even artillery as we will see actually the, the burgundian wars that's where they 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 prayed them from the defeated Burgundians that actually had lots of them because Burgundy is actually the most advanced country in Europe at that point for uh, park of artillery even before uh, France thanks to the uh, Flemish workshops um, you know some of the most technological advanced uh, countries in Europe that again th yeah they're most technologically advanced but they're taken over by the Burgundians that are essentially French armies the same ones the Flemish defeated at Courtrai so even there realize that you can score victories but doesn't mean that you that anything will on the longer run work or that you can develop a further military culture from it right the um this this sense that it's interesting to compare also the protagonist of the aforementioned 14th and early 14th century infantry rise because um yeah, in, in any case um uh, what the, the objective here is is to 
channel the, the power, the collective power of, of, of the pike uh, in, in a punching movement, in, in a maneuvering capacity that could essentially make maintaining infantry cohesion during the march. This was crucial. As we were saying before, up to this point in, in medieval history, you had never had infantries that face in open field um, on a flatland, face to face cavalry. That would have been suicidal, right? Not even during the early 14th century had anything of this had happened. What you have is very good defensive positions with terrain, obstacles, things like these, um, and not abandoning them. Actually, when it happens, uh, there, there are pretty messed up things happening, uh, as in the aforementioned Mon en Pevel um, uh, example, or also in the same Zempak as we've seen before, where the, the first Swiss battle line was essentially crushed by the uh, foot men at arms of the Austrians. Um, but the concept here is that, that there is not even a particular sophistication in defensing. Like a Swiss pike man had just to carry out very, very simple, brutal and primitive movements with a the pike. There was not a, a sophistication. Like even using a halberd was much more complicated, required much more individual training. The effectiveness of the pike square is that, so abandoning even the halberd as such is the collective one is having this this hedgehog fundamentally that you can't really penetrate with cavalry that is designed actually basically to counter it um, and that can shift this this thickly packed man mass through the battlefield even much before that you can realize what the hell is going on because even your feudal troops may be very well trained for feudal standards uh, they generally are very competent but they will not have the amount of collective training delivered by a s such a compact polity like Switzerland that, again, basically invests only in that with even kind of cheaper troops, but manages to uh, attack you from the flank by surprise, whatever, and so compromising the, ent the entire stability of your own formation. It's a gamble, it's a risk, nor... Uh, um, Grandson or, or Morat or Nancy were won by the Swiss just saying, ha, ah, you know, we win, yeah, because we have the better army. No, right? They were freaking out. And I would have never liked to be if it hadn't been for the fact that they ended, they eventually survived. That's quite of an experience to be the, the guy in the, the Pike Square sent out there uh, for, for kilometers where you know that the enemy is there and, and, and uh, hoping, it's just a gamble, it's just rolling the dice, um, hoping that you wouldn't be spot in time for them to react, right, and to counter you adequately by, I don't know, attempting to change front or whatever, right? It's pure gamble. And that is, would say, well, there's no merit in that. Well, there is a merit because on that gamble, you, you have invested essentially a, a huge part of your community, the life of those people, the, the political cost eventually that a, a, a defeat would, um, would, would mean. Like the, the, the confederacy breaking apart, your political position being threatened internally within your own canton, right? So it's actually proving that degree of virtue, of, of vision, of belief, of faith that is needed to to carry out at that point the only thing that you know can give you victory because otherwise you see that you're actually inferior to the enemy on some ground so you have to change that and to have already had the civilizational capacity to predispose your your troops in a way that can perform for example this kind of maneuvers even over essentially one of the best armies in Europe at the time like the Burgundian one so the episode of Arbedo, the des decision properly to pass from essentially a two-thirds halberdier arm, uh, army to one-third of pikemen to essentially almost all, uh, at least the prevalence of, of pikemen and trained that degree of resources that are needed to... Wh why does this cost so much? Because you literally in peacetime you have to bring all those thousands of men to one place and making them 
and, and paying for their food, their, their supplies and so on, for making them train over and over and over and over again in that formation, training them to, to, to maintain the pike stable, which is completely, it's extremely difficult. One thing is holding a pike in defense, you just fix it on the ground, you hold it with your hands, you place a shield on, 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 the, uh, on your shoulder and you wait for the cavalry charge. It takes nerves that you don't even imagine, but at, at the same time you don't really have to do anything like with that pike. Here you have to, to maneuver in a way that that pike doesn't swing excessively, that you know how to hit the enemy effectively in that mass, maintaining the, the, the formation, the lining up, the order of it, and especially you have to convince those people in believing in your project. And that costs enormously, politically, morally, culturally, economically, of course. And yet this is how the Swiss succeeded and created a completely different model that in Europe at the time was, was not used because in Europe at the time the establishment was made up by the feudal elite, or the, pat the patrician elite, um, that were essentially men at arms in relatively contained numbers, uh, plus mercenaries, of course they could hire, but they were often impoverished noblemen and so on, so they came more or less from the same background. And then a, a mass of militiamen that had to essentially to to also to be gradually becoming ever more semi-professional in a way um, and supporting you with different arms. The Swiss are simple. <laughs> they invest just on the pike. In fact, they, they, yes, they, as we were saying before, they have some missile, they have some cavalry, they have some artillery, especially the ones they prayed for, for from the enemy's spoils. But these latter arms are very modest in numbers. They don't need that. Right. Uh, first of all, as we've explained countless times, missile per se, even in the age of firearms, is not decisive until the 18th century. Um, and it's, in any case, it's a matter of combined arms. Uh, the, um, at that point, cavalry as well, th this is not a feudal country. It's just a communal country. It's the entire Switzerland, by the way. Th this aspect is often overlooked. This Switzerland may seem small as a country, like, but at the time really wasn't. Uh, demographically speaking, and it had this uh, national advantage because um, you see uh, even m much more advanced countries, militarily speaking, like I don't know Italy or France, etc., normally hadn't such large amount of, of people to distract from the, uh, the 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 crops, from the the industries, and so on, to engage in these endeavors. Like, think about the Italian signories. Yes, very advanced military speaking. The, Venetia con uh, the Venetian condotta is the, the best army together with the Burgundian one at the time. But, and, and it, ha it does perform very, very highly. But at the same time, the, the, the entire population is relatively small, right? The, the various signories control, yes, importantly populated areas, but not in the millions, like even the, 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 the Swiss can't control. Um, and also, they're not hungry. These are gentrified bourgeois fundamentally that um, just uh, don't see the point uh, other than paying mercenaries to fight in their stead. The Swiss are kind of m advanced politically enough but also uh, culturally primitive enough to blend these two um, ingredients together to r reach an optimal military performance in that, in that way. As we'll see now, it, it lasts actually a few, right? It's not a few for, for the times and, and the originality of the Swiss model per se, which is extraordinary and it lasts for an important amount of time, but eventually more, uh, say, bigger countries that could invest also in kind of mass armies, sometimes hiring the same Swiss, like in the case of France, but having more than that, having heavy cavalry, having artillery, having other infantry, and think about Spain in this sense, the unification of Castilla and Aragon, etc. So even something bigger than the Switzerland would provide with something more advanced. So it's not just the pike square, but also the, again, the missile in form of firearms, artillery, right? And this is something that the Swiss will pay at some point, and also cavalry. Right, cavalry de is decreasing at this point, tactically speaking, but it will never disappear, and it's still an important element. So much that the same 
Swiss Confederacy in the long run will, will have its own cabal during the run because in the meanwhile it kind of gentrified too having scored their having won their place in Europe after all and not getting too much involved as you know and maintaining this um, again neutrality in uh, at least today was in some way but in the past they also were involved in other wars in Germany and or against France and so on in Italy etc um, there there were also problems that however had emerged from the Burgundian wars that the Confederacy needed to fix especially in organization and structure Right, as we were saying before, the fact of having just an infantry army was, the, if you want, the, the most unmodifiable thing. So fighting with a single arm is never kind of a good idea in perspective. And you can be good at it, lucky, um, uh, skilled, etc. But uh, at least in this, in this sense, it's, it, it, it's what the, the Swiss had in, in entirely invested in. So this is not really just the, the thing. Here we're talking about politics as always. And again, confirming the Clausewitzian paradigm. In fact, Charles the Bold, Duke of Burgundy, um, had directed his primary attack in the war against Bern, which had appealed for aid to the other Swiss cantons, and treaties were drawn up specifying the times and places at which help was to be rendered. Because this was again a confederacy and uh, as we were saying before, not everybody agrees at the same time. The Covenant of Stans in 1481 confirmed and supplemented the saint pacher brief in the light of experience gained in the Burgundian War. It laid down that the officers of Allied forces were to be obeyed. This is crucial, because it meant that you had to obey the hierarchy. Right? After all, the Confederacy was trying to take the state to, to a next level of some sort. Of course there were there was an internal tension between those who wanted more of that and those who want less of that. Right? In, in relative terms, even for a country that had built its own identity against kind of the, the feudal um, authority and so on. But it was Im increasingly important in wars of this scale, by the way, to to have a greater unity of command. And this had reflected itself also on, on the field because at some point you needed to put a single commander in charge of all the cantonal forces and this was a guy from, from, from one of the cantons and so it was believed that the way that the campaign was led could favor or, or uh, dis disadvantage in fact some of the cantons rather than others. So um, the idea is that somebody had protested and um, they they all had also endangered the same enterprise because again they there were some troops arriving later um, on the battlefield on purpose um, to preferring maybe a, a defeat um, than that internal political rival than say a victory over a foreign one and this kind of things also um, it was determined that in the future no prisoners were to be taken. This increased, of course, the the t uh, the, the fame of the Swiss um, for for uh, for the wars, let's say, uh, in a terroristic sense. Um, but it had also to do with the the quarrels that um, were connected to the split of the spoils, like at after the, the the victories over the Burgundians, the, the cantons were extremely careful at you know distributing in a certain manner all the various artillery pieces, as we will see, not to cause uh, um, internal conflict because it said you got more, you got le we got less, and kind of, kind of these things. Um, also, additional rules concerning armament were adopted in 1499. So Swiss military prestige, um, which had been further enhanced by the war with Burgundy, was sharply impaired by the French victory of Marignano in 1515 during the Italian wars. 
Uh, I'm making things very simple because there were different expeditions this was carried out at this point, so again, we don't have enough time in a single video to discuss them. But you know that Marignano uh, highlighted that combined armed dynamics we were talking about before, essentially the Swiss infantry found itself uh, out there without um, support under the enemy artillery fire. And this exemplified the vulnerability of a mono arm system against the in fact the, the important also in this case technological improvements of the time. Uh, other countries had better artillery parks than, than the Swiss one that as we've seen was pretty like collection rather than produced. And that was uh, an important problem as we'll see for the Swiss that required essentially external imports for their own artillery also in the following centers was butchery, maging, again, shooting cannonballs into thickly packed uh, bike squares. It's just uh, a bloodbath. Um, henceforth, the Swiss fought less and less for freedom at that point. Actually, the Battle of Marignano had a very few to do with that um, in insight. Uh, rather, the, the, the Swiss had become more aggressive as a power internationally. And, of course, this endangered them by a certain degree but they, they would have had the chance, for example, of taking over Milan, right? And thus creating a sort of Swiss-Italian state that would have, you know, changed the, the history of Europe in a way, would have, of course, shifted much of also the balance from, from, from Switzerland itself, from the cantonal s structure, uh, etc. So paradoxically, that defeat was a fortune for the Swiss um, in, their, in the way, again, we have come to appreciate them. Uh, and, and for the country to core, because again, the elites are interested in the richer places where they have really properly a state, um, more power just internationally. And, and the thing went wrong militarily, but politically, that was a win for, say, the average Swiss, um, except those who were, you know, uh, shot to pieces at Marignano. But they weren't the majority of the Swiss, we can say, uh, not even nearly. Um, and um, in um, in a sense, however, it's true that Europe was becoming more dangerous, right? So, and there were more opportunities, such as the Swiss starting to sell, famously enough, their services abroad. Initially, this was forbidden. Like, as we've seen, nobody could really say, now I will just uh, employ my cantonal troops to serve France. And there is some kind of bitter irony in the fact that um, a country that had created its national identity out of the fight against a feudal um, tyranny, let's say, would be the best supplier of troops exactly for feudal powers. Um, later on, that also eventually worked to copy their model. We can make a video on the Lansk next uh, uh, soon if you want also France on the longer run I made a video about the French native infantry during the Italian wars which as you know were fought by the French mostly with Swiss infantry and not a native one um, but there were advantages to that including the fact that once you had to disband the, the army the Swiss would come back home whereas you know having a, a combatant uh, estate of French veterans ready to challenge also militarily the the aristocracy in France was quite dangerous, as also the Fronde and the French Revolution later on would would prove. Um, so everybody worked out their own thing. Uh, the Swiss model per se gets surpassed by the combined arms, again mostly pioneered by the by the Spanish with uh, with the Battle of Cerignola by um, the Grand Capitan, and uh, at that point essentially copied, becoming the standard. of uh, pike and shot warfare all over Western Europe. I made lots of videos about pike and shot warfare. Um, and also the Swiss naturally adapted to this because for a while they maintained their own kind of more communal idea but at the same time they gentrified and so they needed more artillery, more cavalry. We will see it in the end now. Um, the mm, So a, a new phase of, of Swiss history opens because the especially serving abroad, um, opened the country further, right? Up, also from a cultural point of view. Up to that point, Switzerland had also remained isolated, as we've seen, not particularly prosper per se. Um, the armament of the rural cantons declined, however. Um, 
th this is important because literally the word man will serve the bro, right? And uh, so they depleted, if you want, the, the local military potential because they basically accepted in Europe there were other powers around. You know, think about the Papal Swiss Guards, um, the, the French Royal Guards, um, the German princes also ha often had Swiss mercenaries because um, at the end of the day, the importance of cities, the richest ones in Switzerland, had increased as a form of elite, like Bern, Baal, and Zurich, um, who in fact endeavored to keep their military organization up to date, but the, the rest of the cantons somehow uh, declined, and so uh, it's populace that, as we've seen, was somehow pretty versed for, for fighting, that would think that, you know, being a mercenary in, in the various courts of Europe was somehow a profitable business and this would remain in fact until the throughout all the ancien regime and actually even beyond i mean still today think about the vatican city now at this time the uh, confederation was uh, further weakened by the reformation that main struggle that broke europe uh, apart in the same switzerland um, so essentially the cantons were again separated into camps and even led to military strife between them. The religious conflicts broke out in the middle of the 16th and 17th centuries. As, as you know, uh, Switzerland was also kind of the hotbed of, of Calvinism. And it, 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 it did maintain like part of that kind of unprejudiced, kind of an independent mentality that is also embodied by a certain degree, by, by an important degree, by Protestantism and so on. Um, and this confessional wars lasted even up the beginning of the 18th century. So we're talking about things that the same Swiss uh, against each other wouldn't quite forget, per se. Um, and although service in foreign armies was bad, as we've seen for or at least was a consequence of the, la of the, of the decrease of Swiss military preparedness, the Confederacy benefited from important new influences uh, in the political, in the economic, in the intellectual, and the cultural spheres. Um, there were also some advantages in ser serving other countries abroad. Because, yes, there were so many um, young men of military age permanently out of the country. Because, again, there were s many powers that used the Swiss as guards but still mm, consistent mm, size these so-called capitulations provided that um, they th this man could be called home at once if the fatherland was in danger right it was somehow illusory because those people didn't care especially the powers that paid them didn't care and the pay at the end of the day was the the, the reason why this man had gone abroad um, and uh, it was also uh, again a more general collapse you couldn't even what what would you do there was a threat locally also for these internal wars or let's assume even for external threats and what would all these contingents from the the guard the, the palace guards of your kind of with, with the communications of the time the poor transport condition would, would, would have to get back to Switzerland making a difference like it's somehow Complicated, even assuming again that those countries were not interested in properly not giving a damn about Switzerland in that in that context. Um, uh, however, the urban cantons especially benefited from the lessons learned in the foreign campaigns as well, which brought the same Swiss uh, art of war to to improve according to the most updated uh, European standards. Swiss officers who rose to high rank abroad returned with new ideas concerning properly arms, equipment, training, organization, and so on. And as early as the first half of the 17th century, Zurich and Bern carried out topographical surveys which served as a basis for the new usual usable maps, like a sort of cadastre, the territories that uh, to which the, the cantons were subdivided, um, corresponded to military command districts um, so a general uh, alarm system was instituted 
as well within the, the valleys. Further military agreements um, embracing the Wall Confederation were historically the uh, Villa Abschid in 1647, the Eidgenössische Defensionale in 1668, uh, and the Eidgenössische Schirmwerk, 1702. Um, the Eidgenossen were the Confederates, proper. Um, and all of which um, correspond, in fact, further military regulation, right? Also mm. dealing with issues in, you know, that as they were happening in Europe, the, the situation becoming ever more turbulent. In a way, neighbors, especially France, becoming ever more dangerous. Um, and a major impulse towards the coordination, in fact, was given by the Thirty Years' War. So you see here the Villa Abschied, just uh, one year before the end of it, when the Swiss territory uh, was also fra frequently violated in Germany. Uh, Germany lost one-third of its population during the Thirty Years' War. J just saying, right? Just, just little things that you, you wonder also why the the boom of in, in German philosophy and uh, political theory, literature, and so on occurred after w the, the, the trade of Westphalia had to do with war. Right? So there is always uh, a munus here, uh, uh, a duty and a, and a reward in a way for the, for the, for the military effort. Um, and the, the reason why the Swiss took these precautions is, in fact, the, the, the local army was had not been enough to prevent enemy forces mercenaries etc to 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 enter the country the villa defensionale was the first serious attempt in particular to create a unified efficient swiss military and as its name applies its purpose was defensive as well uh, Switzerland was already by force that kind of kind of okay I'm neutral in, in, in theory like I stay here and you know don't bother me and uh, the confederate forces were uh, on that occasion divided into three levies called Auszüge the first was to comprise 13,400 infantry 400 cavalry and 18 guns so this is a somehow still importantly infantry-based uh, degree, right? Um, then the other two were somehow um, half about the same strength, but they changed the composition so that in case of emergency, that the the confederation could muster about forty thousand infantry, twelve hundred cavalry, and fifty guns. Right, so something that was kind of a bit more equilibrated for uh, the times doctrine in Europe. So to make the long story short, the system remained in, f in force uh, as such until the end of the old Swiss Confederacy, which was essentially uh, destroyed by the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. So Switzerland was uh, restored um, uh, in 1815, like other pre-revolutionary powers, uh, as the by the Confederate Pact. Then there was a new Diet uh, in 1817. That normally the uh, Confederacy operated through these councils, um, and the latter enacted uh, the first military ordinance, the Eidgenössisches Militärreglement, essentially laying down the size of the contingent to be furnished by each canton, again also providing for the standardization of arms and equipment and so on. And the equipment is important here because, as we were saying before, Switzerland really, again, it, it may seem strange for a, a, a mm, traumatically rich country like the one it is today, um, to say the least, but it, it, it began, again, as a pretty modest economic power. And so it was difficult to to uh, properly get the the material for for the troops, the armaments. As we are seeing at the beginning 
the original army of the confederation consisted purely of foot soldiers right so swords spears halberds were just like at the end of the 13th century uh, like pretty much like everywhere else um the long range weapon uh, in the area like in the rest of germany was mainly the crossbow and the defensive armament consisted of a, a very few down the troop um this is typical again of this local militias um which also because of their lack in kind of technological advancement or better mat material uh, availability probably began to invest a bit more in their but were forced by by the pressure that warfare simply imposed in that sense uh, asymmetrically on the collective side of the story um, um, so they had usually just helmets right firearms first appeared in the second half of the 14th century um, like in most uh, countries in Europe uh, and we're talking basically of siege guns at the time naturally never made a video fully on the, the spread of the, the first um, guns uh, with after the introduction of gunpowder technology um, but again there is nothing mm, you know unusual here compared to, to what we see in Europe um, um, and we have no evidence of firearms being used in Swiss warfare until Zempach so we're in 1386 again and also Neffels that happened in 1388 Nef Neffels is a very interesting battle because you have like 500 Swiss defeating 6,000 Austrians, something like that. It's one of those cases of ambush plus exploitation of terrain, senseless attack, uphill against fortified position. The Austrians lost um, an incredible amount of troops, so sad, like almost one third killed. Maybe it's an exaggeration, but it's you know one of those battles that are worth looking at. Um, and only in the early 15th century written sources uh, mention the use of simple handguns right this is a bit slightly later than most of Europe because essentially from the second half of the 14th century that handguns begin to make uh, uh, to, to, to be let's say tactically relevant they become an arm uh, that starts um, gradually supplanting the same crossbows from there on uh, this is not particularly important let's say that warfare at the time was somehow so particularly primitive so it's not handguns that changed the game but it's worth noticing that there is perhaps some technological gap there that Switzerland had to close um, during the old Zurich war fought between 1436 and 1450 we have interestingly however the um, evidence of naval guns used uh, on the lake uh, Zurich between the man of, of the city and the one, the one of, of Auschwitz. Um, so we see that even maybe by lesser scale because of lack of material availability still again the, the doctrine if we can use this term anachronistically for the Middle Ages was still using them pretty much everywhere because that's also how guns initially uh, were, were used like not very differently from any other uh, hand weapon like it could be place everywhere um, in the war against Burgundy we find uh, different kinds of troops appearing in the in the Swiss arm um, first of all mounted units because there were also forces from different places from Savoy from uh, external mercenaries in general and this is just because of course um, Burgundy was hated by other by other people and so there were some of them were siding with the with the Swiss and there wasn't however much of a significant tactical role that they had except pursuing the enemies after the battle uh, by cavalry we find some amount of light field artillery that was pretty much the norm in Europe like this is true also for pre gunpowder uh, artillery you have um, I don't know there, there is a, a hand 
crossbow that by dimension increases and you know reaches the, the large ballistas used in, in siege war. You can't say what's in between, right? It's just also the musket initially was born like one of these light artillery pieces, as a matter of fact, and eventually evolves, um, functionalizes into a into a handgun, right? So um, there were lots of different types. Everything was very much non-standard at this point. The important was just gathering this kind of firepower and making this stuff shooting all together. It doesn't matter how outdated single pieces were. The important is what was the volume of fire that you could achieve. It wasn't particularly large, right? It was just mo mostly annoying the enemy, but maybe forcing him to move and causing some extra damage, morally, primarily, and then also uh, physically. And however, it's at this point that artillery became a separate arm uh, among the Swiss. At this point, arquebusiers and crossbowmen formed uh, special units with their own insignia. This is also normal considering how still kind of the company organization work really. Um, since very since we can't document that the troops were usually separated even though that and they could because they could be also grouped with with others like tactical specialty even though say one canton brought its own amount of pikemen and then then uh, missile troops like this normally in the RAs were were put like all the missile troops with the, the missile troops of the other cantons and so on and the the, the pikemen to etc. Not differently how it was done like by other armies, right? Uh, the most mm, say medieval armies were basically all coalition forces, so it was about creating new units out of scratch uh, organically for, for, for the battle and different divisions that uh, eventually fought together and split in different sections composed by people who came from different places. Now we hear naturally also of sappers, pioneers, the so-called Schaufelbauer, which, uh, referring to the peasantry and the technical skills, again, of these peoples in the mountain, they, they knew how to, to build uh, ditches, uh, huts, things, the chop wood, etc. So they, they were definitely useful. That's what the, the, the average European soldier up to the, the 18th century was drawn from, right? They knew how to live uh, out there in the countryside, right? Um, so th there was here just a further specialization towards the modern age in terms of, okay, let's be ever more. Also, as a business, uh, prepared or organized to, to take care of these this aspects. And as we've, uh, we've seen, always the mass of Swiss troops consisted of halberdiers uh, and pikemen depending on again the period also there were also partisans uh, other weapons that as you know also symbolically survive until the 18th century especially for the NCOs on the battlefields um, so by about the mid 16th century, the, the wheel lock and match lock weapons had been improved to the point that they could replace crossbows. That's basically the, the term which um, even the, the longbow, the crossbow, would become anachronistic in spite of some romantic. That you see, also during the, the English Civil War, there's some, somebody theorizing that, but you know, the, the period of those things was over. But hey, you know, as it happened, if, the, if you were an islander from northwestern Scotland, that you had you were used to fight like that. We find also during the Thirty Years' War men fighting with that. We find even during World War II someone, famously enough, using a longbow, but at that point it's just more like a, a provocation than anything. But it talks about spirit in a way, uh, just not on large scale because you just cause uh, mass losses. Um, and um, uh, spears, halberds also disappear by this in the same time, start, you know, becoming anachronistic. The experience of the Thirty Years' War, as we've seen, was important for especially the urban cantons to form cavalry units alongside the infantry and the artillery that the, the latter was somehow in, in Germany in general uh, and also in, in Flanders, as we've seen, like 
there were enough workshops considered by the early 16th century uh, Germany uh, and Italy were the most technologically advanced countries in Europe and that's why you have also the will lock uh, pistols technology from the from the clock workers the same ones who made those clocks in the quite picturesque German um, town halls and so on um, the idea of being entrenched within your own canton with your own valley your own city was was a typical say communal mentality right also not much of a winning one because at the end of the day this was the age of states that as they were forming starting from France having permanent professional national troops so the systems were anachronistic and that's also the reason why cavalry was needed right so that the uh, confederation could field at least in, in the larger engagements an important offensive capacity like the one that the mounted arm provides and adapting fundamentally to again further the standards of international warfare um, we're talking mostly about um, mounted infantry however not truly really, um, even how the dragoons were starting to, to, to become like more properly cavalry than just again interchangeable troops so th this may have been partially connected also to the Swiss terrain in defense because you know you would have troops having to, to, to behave like a bit like mountain goats but let's not exaggerate I mean th this was just because properly there was not much of an offensive policy and strategy and so for the sake of defense just infantry and artillery can't make most of the work um, cavalry does cost importantly uh, also after the battle of Marignano the confederation maintained um, probably a core of troops for the sole defensive purpose of the country right so this idea of remaining again with with a reserve force that had to parry the country for any external attack was established fairly early right it was was not just properly a defensive a permanent force but still the idea that this now in uh, was imposed to the cantons they all agreed um, uh, more or less at least but still recognizing collectively the need of such defense was quite important um, and as such cities castles developed not just as um, possible strategic um, objectives but also as administrative centers uh, with um, of course for, for, for providing for example with the supplies this had or already been happening but let's say ever more controlled by a confederal government uh, they were naturally further armed fortified to, to withstand uh, the emergency I mean artillery was becoming really serious and most of Switzerland was just like uh, the rest a medieval country so the, the there was an important degree of military engineering there changing with first with the Tras uh, Italienne and then with Vauban uh, and in fact uh, in the late 16th and the, in the 17th century um, you have Zurich, Bern, Ball, Solothurn, Schaffhausen and other Swiss towns protected with new up-to-date defensive works right with the best military engineering and architecture available the necessary war material was stored in decentralized arsenals so that in this mountainous country you could properly maximize the uh, the benefits deriving from uh, having a in-depth defense from some places that can properly not be accessed even if some cities on the, the outer side are more uh, exposed targets let's say um, the especially heavy guns for defense in fact were uh, stored here that these were known as the battery pieces which were much increased and by the 18th century in fact the confederation possessed about 1600 guns which is a lot for this, considering the, the country the population um, we're talking about both garrison and field artillery mm -hmm. which however were not so um, let's say efficient perhaps they were not so standardized right uh, this derived in part from the same uh, 
cantonal autonomies of how they decided. But let's say, as we were saying before, it's not much of an update technological level. Uh, it's rather the amount of firepower that, uh, especially for a defensive purpose strategically, um, doesn't have to deal, for example, with excruciating marches across Europe as they, they were starting to be needed strategically out, out there in the continent just to be broke um, uh, for for a defense purpose like you know it was okay it was the good enough that we often refer to now how did this material was procured practically so originally in you know medieval situation the local communities had uh, smiths they produced normally spears halberds i mean even certain farmers could could create on their own uh, you know some of these anti-cavalry weapons at least in a stationary sense like the Vosges and the albert also evolved from agricultural tools um, and again the swiss mountaineers knew how to leave uh, uh, out there um, pretty independently however there were some technological feats of western warfare that um, needed somehow or at least that were more conveniently Im imported in Switzerland. And we're talking even about swords, right? And by the time the, the Swiss Confederation is born, you have exactly in that decade the, the generalized spread of the double-handed sword all over Western Europe. Switzerland possessed no metal supplies, right? Differently from Austria, for example, that historically since Roman times had good... Uh, uh, think about the Calbus Noricum, very um, carbonized iron, at least in the right degree of making it mm, uh, steel by some classification. Um, thus, the raw materials for war uh, at the time were rare in in the in the country. Corresponding importance attached to spoils and the custom of remaining on a battlefield for three days after the victory may have also provided with the opportunity in fact of gathering carefully all the, the the arms and the armor you know that normally the enemies as far as the friends were actually uh, stripped naked and then buried in common graves and then all what could be gathered unless you you didn't fear that um, there was the plague in the army you didn't want to touch the, the corpse etc uh, you would you would loot right there were literally people joining these armies everywhere and just for stripping the corpses along the way, like parasites. Um, in armor, as you understand, was the most expensive um, tool. Uh, there was no important Swiss production of armor before the 16th century. Not even in the towns that, as you know, that were the most technologically advanced centers, as they could access uh, logistically the international uh, resources uh, more easily. So if we look at the older armor in the Swiss uh, armories, museums, and so on, we're talking about the, the 15th, the 16th century. And you realize that most of this stuff were loot coming from the northern Italian campaigns um, considered that they had Milan, that was the single most important and advanced, uh, you know, armor technology uh, industry in Europe, just a step away. So, in that sense, looting Lombardy was was pretty convenient. Um, and uh, uh, the you also realize that there was a lot of economy attached to these um, uh, loot for for a very long time because this armor was not um, let's say thrown away um, it was treasured preserved as much as possible in its original state and also partially modernized with some additions over the generations to be used again and again uh, this tells you of how much this was were in need of armor it is true that armor was decreasing essentially from the, the 16th century onwards, the 15th is the one where we have more metal on the battlefield, um, at least for, for armor, like in a broader historical sense, uh, for body armor. Um, 
and um, eventually firearms render it inconvenient, but then you have to start importing arquebuses, muskets, and the Swiss had difficulties in producing them too as well. Uh, and only in the second half of the 15th century there is evidence of some Swiss home pr armor production on a considerable scale. Right? Um, we see that mostly the Swiss invested in offensive weapons, the swords, uh, the, the spears, uh, while um, as we've seen there was also a great Im importance attached to artillery and given that the and that this may also this kind of material poverty may be a reason why again that was a an investment in collective training because the more you collect uh, you, you 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 train collectively even if you don't have that specific material you need for armoring these people you can actually render these troops effective without needing to to armor them and this is the point in fact pike squares in renaissance warfare are fundamentally not armored because the, the first ranks are but the wide majority of the troops uh, have if anything very light armor and they tend to uh, that tends even to disappear um, it would have been even properly too costly to equip all of, of those troops in in a heavy way and so useless um, have to increase actually in firepower and that's exactly what would happen the Swiss captured an immense booty at the battles of Granson and Morat, uh, where the Burgundians again lost some of the most updated artillery they, uh, available in Europe. Right? And this was scrupulously divided, as we were remembering, among the victorious Swiss cantons to get everyone their due. And uh, it's only at that point concretely that the Swiss have a real uh, garrison and field artillery in sufficient number right and remaining pretty aware of its importance and so also um, needing to to provide for more but for financial reasons it was just the rich city cantons that could supply themselves adequately with artillery until the late 18th century. In other words, uh, the interland just was was also backwards in that regard. But it's a bit like you see the Celtic fringe uh, in, in northwestern Europe. You see, just they, they kept fighting with what they had for a very long time, almost. Uh, a 17th century Highlander was not very different from a medi medieval one at that point. Um, Switzerland is slightly different. Uh, also because the prevalence of the city cantons is definitely reflected also in the proportionally in the av availability of military forces and the effective ones and the size of ones also politically that made the, the lion's share the principal cannon foundries in Switzerland that produce also bells um, as the gun barrels were cast in bronze right they had the same technology to produced them were uh, the Füssli in Zurich, the Maritz in Bern, the Kaiser in Solothurn and Zug, and the Schalk in Schaffhausen. And these companies must not be overlooked because they had the technology. So at some point they produced even enough um, artillery to supply uh, neighboring foreign countries, interestingly enough, as well as home market because the other cantons needed of their guns, but they even extended uh, some mm, methods of mm, manufacture which were innovative for the time and adopted even abroad. Nothing revolutionary, but say still, right? Uh, you know, as centers of excellence, together with other you know technological feats. You know, think about the Swiss clocks at least. We're talking about the same uh, technologically cultural background. Um, the barrels were generally cast in a mold in the same way as belts, as we were saying. Maritz in Bern even cast uh, iron barrels in a solid form and bore them out cons uh, subsequently, right? A practice that would be followed also elsewhere in Europe, interestingly enough. Um, however, uh, Switzerland alone didn't have the uh, 
by scale properly the uh, the scientific um, the, the economic the infrastructural uh, means to compete with the most advanced countries militarily wise uh, in the 17th and the 18th century France had the best artillery in Europe so uh, most of the uh, Swiss problems uh, connected by the way with the lack of standardization calibration mounting um, etc were better solved by buying French cannons especially from the city of Strasbourg that is in fact quite close to Switzerland and it is where one of the chief royal foundries in France uh, was situated um, so they, they had at least uh, a close supply of that uh, small arms in the modern age were starting being produced almost in every town except also here was generally speaking more convenient to import them also in large numbers and chiefly from Thuringia uh, in Germany uh, uh, this this was normally if you look at the timeline because during the 30 years war there had been an overproduction crisis lots of Western weapons were sold to basically at lower prices also to the Ottomans etc so also minor powers were you know um, exploiting the situation and the Swiss were quite you know uh, bankingly you know um, intelligent in that sense already so in the 17th and the 18th century what you have is the main center of firearms manufacture in the Jura mountains because there there, there was a limited but still present supply of iron uh, and so the the local gunsmiths having to work also with with a with a precious amount with an important um, demand would uh, find a very uh, ingenious way of improving the quality they were also very experienced watchmakers as we we're um, recalling before so again um, that's uh, an interesting area of technological development so today we don't talk about the today's Swiss army that is born afterwards the one of the old confederation but it's obvious that the Swiss military tradition um, leaves still deeply in, in the contemporary army uh, that was created in fact in the 19th century and um, as such every able bodied citizen is obliged still to bear arms and he's proud of the weapons which he keeps in his own home as you know there is a great uh, weapon uh, culture in, in Switzerland um, and it's, it does start from that uh, historical background like up to the medieval times um, and the idea is mostly of the of a defensive purpose for the individual as much as the country uh, the military uh, service, as you know, in Switzerland is one of the most formative experience um, because it's it's really uh, general. So um, the the entire country is again designed around this, this strong connection between the political um, action and the use of violence, which is 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 a principle of of. A foundational principle of Western civilizational superiority over the world, um, and a, as it spots the, the what what really politics is and what war is at the end of the day, it's just a continuation of politics with other means. So, being culturally educated, militarily trained, and having in your life this this kind of um, formation is one of the single most um, uh, powerful uh, tools for your individual development and achievement, right? An unregulated one is destructive instead, like everything. So, so this has nothing to do with owning guns or not owning guns. This is about owning guns because you know, beyond knowing how to shoot them, why you 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 can um, and what what that can mean and if you don't study history at a serious level if you don't understand exactly what your that sense that national identity concretely means you can't you can't be responsible but in that sense you can't 
even be militarily effective, which is the reason why, uh, you know, countries where people are responsibilized, they, they, they're, they don't have moral standards, and they don't have any education, they're just, you know, thinking that politics is run by some people elsewhere, and then things that don't, do not affect them, when brought on the battlefield, they're just uh, going to be butchered like wild animals, and, you know, that's objectively what they deserve for their lack of political, cultural, personal, and moral worth. And this is exactly what studying military history teaches you. And that's why children from a young age should be introduced to properly the concept that next to politics and society there is war, what this is, how it works, to be taught with sane, healthy, uh, scientific clausewitz and principles and not in the kind of um, fanboyistic way that, you know, most uh, adult males fundamentally in uh, at the beginning of the third millennium think that, um, you know, it means to have uh, a strategic education which uh, would be better not, not to have in the first place and has no worth of any kind. Uh, for today, however, we stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.